Ok, um, li ho sgridati oggi, sono andato al Grand Hotel mentre mangiavano, gli ho fatto andare di traverso il flan di carciofi. No, li ho sgridati, vi ho detto, ma insomma qui bisogna cominciare a tirare dei pugni. I told you off, didn't I? Hello? I told you off today. I said throw punches. Um, cominciamo con la MMT. Qui entriamo veramente nel vivo della, di questa idea di come si può eh, spendere in uno Stato per noi. Okay? Um, non so se state sentendo la traduzione, lo posso anche dire in inglese se non ci sono le cuffie, però è una cosa importante che qualcuno di voi dovrebbe... Testing, testing, can you hear me? Something, testing, testing. qualcosa can you importante hear me? che qualcuno di voi dovrebbe eh, eh, so, dire oggi pomeriggio fuori dal discorso strettamente MMT è questo problema dello MMT spostamento della giurisdizione legale dei titoli di Stato cioè succede che, uh, e io ho letto sul Financial Times che è successo nel caso della Grecia che uh, una buona parte dei titoli di Stato uh, ancora in, in scadenza vengono trasferiti di giurisdizione dallo Stato sovrano a uno Stato esterno che può essere l'Inghilterra o lo Stato di New York e questo crea problemi spaventosi poi per nel caso è un'uscita dall'euro della nazione di cui si parla se questo succede o è già successo nel caso di Italia siamo nei guai vorrei che diceste due parole di questo perché poi Michael 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 Ecco, e poi c'è anche il problema, Michael, per favore parliamo dei voucher funds, perché cioè abbiamo parlato dell'Islanda come un caso trionfale eh, di opposizione a questa, ma c'è il problema dei voucher funds, che è un problema che incombe sull'Italia ed è un problema gravissimo, quindi vi chiedo di parlare di queste due cose. Comincia Stephanie Kelton. Now we will start the afternoon session with Stephanie Kelton, however. Comincia Stephanie Kelton. Entriamo nel vivo della MMT, ok? And so let's uh, start to dealing with MMT. Good afternoon. Thank you for coming back. We have a lot more to do. The next thing I want to do is talk to you about functional finance. It's not a very interesting sounding topic. In English, the opposite of functional finance is dysfunctional finance. And that's what I would argue most countries in the world deal with today. And I think the reason is because none of us that have sovereign currencies understand exactly what that means. And we act as if we face the same kinds of constraints, governments act that way, that households and businesses face. We're told all the time that a government should have sound fiscal finances, should live within its means, should exercise fiscal discipline, just the way a household must. But hopefully by now, you understand that a country that operates with its own fiat currency, that is a non-convertible currency, government does not pledge to convert the currency into gold or into some other country's currency, doesn't have to behave like a household. It can use its powers differently. And that's what functional finance is all about. I mentioned this morning the name Abba Lerner. Abba Lerner wrote many important 
articles and books that influence the work that MMT economists do today. Most of Lerner's early and important works were written as the world was fighting and battling the effects of the Great Depression. Lerner understood, as Keynes did, that unemployment was a normal feature of any money-using capitalist economy. For Lerner, unemployment wasn't just something that countries needed to deal with when there was a Great Depression or a serious recession, but in normal times as well because the economy always operates with some level of unemployment. Lerner, as an economist, viewed the workings of the economic system very differently from the conventional, classical economist, who believes supply creates its own demand. Markets naturally tend to full employment. Governments just get in the way. Intervention by government is unnecessary and destabilizing. When something bad happens in the economy, the best course for government is to keep its hands off. Laissez-faire. Let it be. Markets will fix themselves. They are self-correcting. Lerner didn't accept this, and neither did Keynes. They both understood that market economies are complex, that the decisions taken by the producers are different and not coordinated with the decisions taken by consumers, foreigners, other businesses, government. Lerner did not believe there was a mechanism that would coordinate the spending decisions of all of us with the production decisions of the business sector in a way that kept the economy operating in a healthy manner, in a way that would provide full employment for everyone. Businesses have to produce today without knowing what the future demand for their products will be. Maybe they produced too little and demand was higher than they expected. In that case, they see their inventories fall and it's a good sign to them. People want more output. They respond by producing more. But if businesses produce output and find that the demand is not there, their inventories begin to rise, the signal to them is, you've produced too much. What do they do? Conventional economic theory tells us this is not a problem. If inventories build up, prices fall until there's demand for everything that's produced. But in the real world, we know better. We know how businesses respond when demand for their goods is falling. They respond by cutting back their production and laying off a part of the workforce. It gives rise to unemployment. It's natural. That's the way market economies all operate. There isn't a single capitalist economy anywhere in the world that achieves full employment and sustains it. Every market economy goes through a business cycle, an upswing where times are good and unemployment is low, and a downswing where times are not good and unemployment is rising. Lerner recognized that 
and he called on the government to respond in a particular way. The conventional view is that if there's unemployment, it simply means employers don't want to hire the workers at such a high price. The solution to unemployment for most of the academic economists in the world is therefore lower wages. Right? Too much supply of labor, unemployment, must mean the price of labor is too high. So the solution is to cut wages. If something goes wrong in markets, you let markets fix things, keep government out. Sometimes economists talk about structural problems in the labor market. Well, unemployment exists because the jobs that are available require certain skills that the unemployed don't have. Therefore, they propose things like training programs for the unemployed. All we need to do is get the unemployed together, train them, give them better skills, and they will go out and find jobs. The problems are almost always with the worker. Lerner and Keynes and the MMT school rejects the notion that the problem is with the worker. The problem is that there aren't enough jobs. If you took a hundred dogs and you buried 95 bones in a field and you told the dogs their job was to go out and find a bone, what's the very best case scenario? The best you can possibly hope for is that 99 dogs come back with bones. Five dogs can't get bones. More likely, some dogs will get lucky. They'll stumble across a few extras. Some may have better skills. They'll find three or four. So the number of dogs that come back without bones may be 10 or 15. The conventional economist would gather the dogs together, the ones that had no bones, and train them to sniff out bones more effectively. Then they would send those hundred dogs back out into the field and tell them to go come back with a bone. And again, the best you can get is 95 dogs with bones. What's wrong is that there aren't enough bones. There's nothing wrong with the dogs. The bones are the jobs. There's nothing wrong with the unemployed. There simply aren't enough jobs. Economists actually believe that unemployment is not just unavoidable, but actually beneficial. They think that unemployment helps to discipline the worker. Because if you're afraid of becoming unemployed, you're more likely to work harder, do a better job for fear that you may lose your job. Economists believe in a trade-off. We could have lower unemployment, but that would lead to inflation. And that's the worst possible evil in the world. So we better keep some people unemployed so the economy doesn't operate at too high a level, so that we can keep prices from rising too rapidly. So they actually define full employment as the level of unemployment that helps you keep prices from rising. We define 
unemployment into our models. We accept it. It provides an excuse for not striving for more. We enshrine it in our policies. The Maastricht Treaty does not place full employment as a goal at all for the central bank, for the ECB. It has a sole mandate, which means there is really only one cruel enemy in the world, and that is inflation. The Federal Reserve in the United States has a dual mandate, at least in theory. The central bank in the U.S. is supposed to use policy to keep prices stable, but also to try to encourage high levels of growth and high levels of employment. At the end of the day, though, the Fed considers price stability the primary objective, probably recognizing that there's little the central bank can do anyway. Employment policy does not belong with the central bank. It belongs with the national government as part of its fiscal policy. And that's where Lerner placed it. Unemployment is every bit as damaging to a society as inflation. The costs are tremendous. We know and we talked this morning about what some of those costs are. The direct costs are obvious. Anyone who's not working, not producing something, represents an economic waste. A loss of output for the whole of society, an income that's not produced. But there are other costs, maybe even more important. Indirect costs. We talked this morning about some of these. What happens when you're unemployed? You feel excluded from society. Your skills degrade. The longer you're unemployed, the longer your skills break down. The longer you're unemployed, the, le the less employable you are. Businesses don't want to hire people who've been unemployed for months or, in the case of the U.S., years. Unemployment creates psychological harm, depression, anxiety, suicide rates increase. It may be great for the pharmaceutical companies who sell antidepressant drugs and make billions, but it's very, very damaging for society. People lose their motivation, family relations, divorce, spousal abuse, all become problems when unemployment is high. It's difficult to measure these kinds of costs, but it can be done. Just this year, the White House put out a study that attempted to figure out exactly what are the costs of having a young person unemployed, not in school. What are the indirect costs that are borne by all of us? Crime goes up. You lose your job, you lose your health care, you get sick, health care costs increase because you don't seek care until you're quite ill. Spending on various social programs increases because you don't have an income to support yourself. The White House estimates that the cost of a single unemployed, out of school, young American is almost $38,000 per year. Now the direct costs, the loss of output and income from having someone 
sit on the sidelines producing nothing as opposed to being in a job producing a good or service in the economy. If you see the light gray line at the top, it shows you what the path was for the U.S. GDP before the financial crisis and the recession. If that had never happened, the estimate is we would have been up on that light gray line. But because of the financial crisis and the economic recession, our GDP fell sharply. The difference between the blue line and the gray line is our GDP gap. It represents the lost income, the lost production from all of the additional unemployment. How much is that? Bill Mitchell, who is a major MMT figure, has run the numbers. What he did was estimate the daily costs of unemployment in the U.S. The difference between the blue line and the gray line on a daily basis. And he concludes that the U.S. is sacrificing the equivalent of between six and eleven billion dollars every single day that we permit our unemployment level to remain elevated. So Bill says, and he doesn't mince words, he says, just say to yourself, every day the U.S. government is allowing $9.7 billion dollars to go down the drain in lost income just because they're too stupid to implement sensible job creation. What is sensible job creation? If, if you ask a technocrat, or a member of the conservative party in the U.S., they'll tell you that the key to job creation is creating a better environment for businesses. Okay, I agree. But what does creating a better environment mean? For them, it means lower taxes. It means less regulation. Those are the things that are really holding the employer back. That's why they won't hire and invest. It's why the economy's not growing. But ask an employer what's holding them back. Survey after survey in the US tells us that it's not high taxes or burdensome regulation that's primarily keeping them from adding to their workforce and increasing their investment spending. It's poor sales. They don't have customers. And the reason that they don't have customers is that we had a financial crisis that was fueled by a huge debt bubble that crashed and left major portion of the U.S. population without the income to go shopping. The fundamental economics for a person like Lerner, Keynes, or an mmt -er is simple. Sales create jobs. Employers hire workers when they are swamped with demand, not when they get a tax cut, not when regulations are eased. Customers create sales. But customers have to have income to spend. So income creates sales. 
and spending creates income. Every time someone spends money, someone else is on the receiving end. It becomes their income. If you think that you're going to cut your way to prosperity, I think you've got your economics all backwards. Fiscal austerity, sound finance, as they call it, means cutting spending. But that means cutting income. But that means cutting sales. And that means losing jobs. So what did Lerner suggest? Unemployment exists because there's not enough spending in the economy. In any economy in the world, spending comes from one of four places. The household sector, the biggest and most important source of demand in the economy. Business sector, the government sector, and the rest of the world. Whatever they want to buy from you. What's the problem today? Consumption spending is down because income is down. If people aren't consuming, businesses don't have customers, investment spending falls. So two important components of demand in the economy are massively depressed right now. Learner's recommendation is that you have to offset that with government spending. Functional finance is the term he gave to his proposal for the way the government should run its fiscal macroeconomic policies. You have to have a sovereign currency in order to run functional finance. You cannot do it on a gold standard or with fixed exchange rates. You can't do it with the euro. The US has a sovereign currency, but its finances are dysfunctional. Just because we can doesn't mean we do. So it's not enough just to create the correct monetary system. You also have to create the correct macro policy. Abba Lerner wrote a very colorful article called The Economics of the Steering Wheel. And in the beginning of the article, he talks about this imaginary planet where the Martians drive around on this complicated interplanetary highway system. The cars don't have steering wheels. The roadways have high curbs. The cars bounce from left to right, meandering around the path. Lerner says, if, an, if someone from Earth visited this planet, they would look at this highway system and call it crazy. Wow, aren't we clever? Amer I mean, in, in, on Earth. We put steering wheels in our cars. We don't bounce around from curb to curb. We control our destiny. And then he says, why aren't we so smart when it comes to our economy? We give up the steering wheel. We let markets push us around. And we assume there's nothing we can do. Laissez-faire, let it be. So what does Lerner want? Functional finance. The government's job is twofold. One, the government has to keep the level of spending in the economy high enough to maintain full employment. Two, the government uses its powers to adjust taxes, spending, in order to achieve the first goal. You don't target an arbitrary deficit level. 
you let the deficit go where it needs to go in response to what's happening in the economy. Taxes don't finance the government. They help drive the monetary system. They get the government's currency accepted. They give it value. But the government doesn't need to get money from the private sector to spend. The government spends by issuing its own currency. The government doesn't even need to borrow to do this. In fact, Lerner said it shouldn't. Borrowing takes money from those that have it when the goal is to let people spend as much as they will on their own to get to full employment. With a sovereign currency, governments spend by directing their bank to credit someone else's account. This almost always happens without the government even writing a check. In the modern era, governments spend with keystrokes. And you can't run out of keystrokes. We sometimes say, the government is like a scorekeeper. If you go to a football match and your team is doing really well, scoring goal after goal after goal after goal, do you sit in the audience and worry that the stadium is going to run out of points? Impossible. It's also impossible for the government to run out of keystrokes. There's no financial constraint on a government that issues its own currency. The only relevant constraints are real constraints, resource constraints. If you try to use more resources than there are available, you'll push up the price of those resources and the result will be inflation. So what should the government do? Use its powers to tax and spend to keep the economy operating at the right temperature. Lerner thinks of taxes and bonds not as financing tools, but like a, like a thermostat in your home. What do you do if it's too cold? Turn up the heat. What do you do if you're too warm? Turn down the heat. Same thing with the economy. If the economy is not operating at a high level, you cut taxes or increase spending. If the economy is operating too hot, you raise taxes or cut spending. These are tools to use to achieve the goals of the macroeconomic policy. Lerner recognized that deficits are normal. The economy, government will almost always be in deficit. And that was OK for him. When it comes to the type of deficit, what should the government spend on? If it cuts taxes, who should benefit? MMT advocates a wide range of programs. The most important is probably the job guarantee. Very briefly, the job guarantee is a program that would allow the government to achieve what's never been achieved before in any market economy, true full employment. The basic idea is that the government offers a wage and a benefits package to anyone who's unemployed but ready and willing and able to work. This program acts as a buffer stock. It absorbs workers when the economy is weak, and it releases workers when the economy is strong. 
they flow in and out of the government employment program as the economy goes through natural cycles. The benefits of such a program are many, and we probably can talk more specifically later this evening. Thank you.